Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two for my C16 CPU replacement slash troubleshooting video. Uh, I was originally just replacing the CPU and it turned out that the computer didn't work. So it's time for some troubleshooting to see if we can get this machine up and running. Make sure to watch part one. I'll put a link in the description below. You'll probably see a little uh, thing on the side of YouTube if you're watching on your phone or your computer. Uh, but yeah, check the link and all right, let's get right to it, to the troubleshooting. All right, so let's do some probing with the scope. And I know in the past people have complained that uh, I didn't show the oscilloscope while I was doing this type of testing, so I will show it to you now. I am going to use my little printout of the pinout for the CPU and I'm going to check the data and the address lines on the CPU. Sorry for the crappy quality of this lower camera. I'm using a webcam and it really seems to pick up strobing in my uh, underbench lighting. Okay, so I have my oscilloscope probe here. The ground for the oscilloscope is connected there. I have the oscilloscope set for two volts per division. All right, and let's power up this C16. All right, it's powered up and we're not getting the picture. So I'm actually just going to shut off or actually I'm going to pull this out since I don't need the monitor. So first of all, I'm touching the, this, the probe here and we see that, that movement. Let's just check the output of the voltage regulator here. All right, so we're getting five volts. So I here have this uh, measurement on, so it's five volts average, or you know the max and min, but that's fine. Uh, peak to peak is underneath there, you can't see it, but it's 5.08, looking good. So we know we have the, the scope configured correctly. So moving on to the CPU. Let's just start at the 6501 on pin one. And this should be the clock signal. Now if we adjust this, okay, and I must have to get my trigger set correctly. All right, 1.36 megahertz. I don't remember exactly what this thing should be running at, but I know it's above one megahertz. And yes, that is slightly overdriving the MOS 6510, but you saw that this worked perfectly on the other computer. The piece, the pin 40 is the reset pin. So when I turn the computer off and when I turn it back on, that should stay low for a second. Power on, yep, okay, so it should stay low while the computer resets and there's a reset button. If I push this, yep, processor resets. Okay, so that looks good. So really, we wanna check out uh, all the address lines. So we start here, uh, let's just check uh, this uh, VCC. So pin one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's uh, just the five volts. All right, so the pin that was below next to that is the AEC pin, which to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what that should be doing, but as long, we're just checking to make sure that we don't have something that's sort of stuck somewhere in the middle or held low or held high. So this kind of up and down peaking is actually totally fine. So we have VCC and the next pin is address line zero. Okay, that looks good. So there's plenty of activity. Let's uh, reduce the time scale here. So we've got stuff going on. Zero, one, wait, I lost my place. <laughs> That's VCC. We got pin zero, pin one. I gotta say that that looks a little strange. Something is, something is stuck. So, so something is definitely not looking correct there. So that's address line zero. So I'm just gonna go through all of these. And they all look exactly the same, to be honest. Oh, that one looks a slightly different. Hmm. So I'm gonna go all the way, just checking that anything doesn't look kind of out of the ordinary. I think we're gonna hook the logic analyzer up to this after. So yeah, these, these all look funny. Oh, that pin, that's address line. Not even sure which one that is. So that would be address line 13. Nothing. That one's got nothing. All these got nothing. They look a little. I right, see when I turn it on, we get we get a signal for a second. Hit reset. So we're getting something on the pins there. Sorry, I'm blocking the camera view. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting activity here. So even though while it's idle, okay, th yeah, that's there. We go, looks fine. Hmm. 
Yeah, okay, so all of these are okay. I mean, from a voltage perspective, we're getting, you know, a peak voltage of in the four, so as long as it's not like some something that's held at a strange level. All right, so that looks fine. I'm gonna say that all the address lines are fine. There's no shorts on the address lines. Next, we're gonna look at these uh, data lines here. So we're gonna start on this fourth pin and we're gonna go down through all seven of them. So, all right, we got lots of activity on data line. Oh, okay, that well, looks a bit funny, but. Okay. Getting to data lines. Okay, so I was doing uh, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, well, nothing looks shorted, nothing looks weird. I don't know. Seems okay. I think we're going to hook the logic analyzer up. And we're going to see what we find on that. Okay, I have the logic analyzer hooked up to this um, chip over here, and I think I found a problem. Uh, really, the way I troubleshoot this, and I didn't show you doing this on camera, but I start looking at the schematics. You know, I check all the data lines, address lines, and all these chips, but then I started having to look at these logic chips, and all you can do is go with the schematics and kind of trace back what you should be seeing on these chips and kind of look through the gates and things. So let's go over what I found. This is the schematics for the plus four. The gate that I think is having a problem, at least at the minimum, is this one right here. So U12 uh, is a 74LS02. What is it here? It's a quad input NOR gate. So looking at these pins, one, two, and three, okay? What's happening here is we look at one, two, and three. So two and three are input pins and the output is pin one. It, it's an OR, it's a, well, it's a NOR gate. NOR means it's an OR, so it's either A or B equals an output, but when it's a NOR, it's a NOT OR, so it's the opposite. So for instance, if the inputs A and B are both high, or five volts, then because it's a NOR gate, it'll be low. Looking at the spectrum analyzer, or I'm sorry, looking at the logic analyzer, all right, so pin three is hooked up to the red wire. So this is pin three. I don't know how to label it with this. I just got this uh, logic analyzer. So pin three, the RW pin, is this one. Pin two, which is the one coming to PLA, is the brown, which is the top one. So that's pin two. And then the output, which is pin one, is this one right here. So if you look right here at this spot, so right here, this, this line here, we got two high inputs and we got a low output, which is correct, right? If we look at our truth table, which is right here, we get two highs and we get a low, correct. Now over here though, I'm not sure <laughs> how to mark this. Oh, there we go. If I zoom in, you can see that the input there is going low. So at that exact moment right there, between these two markers, we have a low and we have a high and we look at our truth table, a low and a high, oh, it's still a low. All right, so I've been uh, spending some time troubleshooting this C16, and I was using the schematics, I was using my oscilloscope, using my logic analyzer, I don't know, I spent an hour and a half sort of fiddling around just trying to look at the logic and whatnot on the schematic, see if I could see a match on the scope and logic analyzer. And, uh, you know, I was not really getting anywhere. So I decided to just socket all the logic chips. Because remember at this point, I knew the CPU that I made, the TED, the PLA were all working. The two ROMs I had swapped out, but over here, besides the two RAM chips, everything else was regular 74 logic. So it would be easy for me to get another part, be easy for me to test these chips outside the board, and I happen to have one extra RAM chip, 
which is right here. So I figured I could socket both RAM chips and then swap this into either spot to see if that was the problem. So you'll notice that I have one chip missing and there's a two chips sitting here. What I end up doing is I use my handy dandy Mini Pro these are all available from China on eBay. Very inexpensive EEPROM programmer. But what a lot of people don't realize about these is that they can also test 74 logic chips. Let's take this one right here. This is a 74 LS139. This was the one that was inside this board. It was in this socket here that's empty. We'll put that in here. And we bring up the software here. And normally you're flashing, you know, uh, ROMs or EEPROMs, things like that or you're doing uh, pals and gals, but we're gonna do Logic IC. And notice down here it says TTLC MOS testing. So you type in what you're trying to test, Logic IC, you pick this, you hit select, and now essentially you shows you how to insert the chip. And we hit test. I actually went through this process and tested all the other chips. I removed from the board all the other 74 Logic chips. Everything worked fine, but this one, when I put it in, uh, tester sure enough you see the error here g1 line error and these other errors so i don't know exactly what this chip is <laughs> to be honest i didn't even look it up but i looked at my parts and i found another one same exact uh 79 or 74 ls 139 and when i hit test test normal so that chip is definitely bad so let's insert this back into the motherboard here okay and let's plug in the monitor all right, let's see what happens when I turn this on. Oh, look at that. Commodore Basic 3.5, 12K free. The funny thing is, is I was gonna upgrade this to 64K. I, I just need to get the extra chips. This is, this is a 64K chip. And uh, you swap out the two RAM chips. And I think you have to do slight modifications, like lift a pin on one of these 74 Logic chips, run an extra address line, something like that. And then uh, this works as a 64K machine. So this chip here, bad went bad and uh, was bringing the whole computer down with that black screen. You know, uh, the funny thing is that the troubleshooting with the schematics, I, I probably spent an hour, hour and a half, and it maybe took me 30 minutes max to replace all these chips. Testing them was a piece of cake with the Mini Pro, and uh, it took me a couple minutes to find this chip and or the extra one, and um, I'm up and running. I didn't really show great troubleshooting skills by trying to figure out exactly which logic chip was bad. If I had just swapped out these chips and soccered them all at the beginning and not bothered with any of the uh, troubleshooting after I'd already checked these ROMs and other socket chips, but if I had not spent time probing all the logic signals, just swapped these out, I would have saved myself time and had a working machine much more quickly. So, yeah, hmm. All right, so I have this thing working right now, and I put it back in the case bottom, at least. I hooked up my SDIEC. If you remember back to part one, I talked about the fact that the I.O. pins have switched around on the uh, CPU. And that has the effect of rendering the cassette capability and the floppy capability inoperative. So let's turn this on, and let's try and do a directory. Now it says searching for a dollar sign, but no activity lights at all are coming up on my SDIEC. This is clearly not working. Um, I mean, I didn't really need to test this. I already knew that there was gonna be a problem. Based on Andy's blog back in part one, he said that you need to customize kernel. Now when Andy developed his kernel for this adapter, he actually disassembled the stock kernel and found all of the parts of it that control the I.O. ports that basically go to those I.O. pins on the processor for running the serial and cassette and he remapped them to take advantage of the 6510. The kernel on this machine, unlike the C64, is actually different depending on whether you have the NTSC machine or you have the PAL machine. So unfortunately, trying his kernel out, which he emailed me, didn't get me anywhere. So if you take a look at the computer here, you see I have an NTSC 6510 kernel. And what I did is I used a hex editor to compare these three files, and I found that the routines that Andy modified to control the I.O. ports so the disk drive would work, these routines were identical inside the NTSC and PAL kernels. Therefore, using a hex editor, I just hex edited the NTSC kernel, the stock one, and I added Andy's changes to that. Let's burn that onto uh, an EEPROM. Let me go grab a chip. Into the Mini Pro. 
So program. All right. So let's pop this. All right, that's popped in. Okay, so yep, I popped in the EEPROM there. That's the freshly program one that actually has the kernel on it. And uh, let's turn this on. Boom, there we go, it's working. Okay, so load, comma eight. Oh, got the green LED on there. There it is. So if I load star, keyboard layout is a little different than on the C64. This will give us the file browser because it's gonna auto load the one designed for the C16. For and there it is. So let's talk about the limitations of this particular ROM mod. It absolutely works with the SDIEC, with actual floppy drives, works as well. Uh, Andy's blog, if you check that, I'll put the link in the description below. He mentions that the cassette does actually work. It's just the motor control is bad. So you have to do something with a diode or something like that. I never tried it. I don't even have something to plug in. I don't have a cassette drive. So I have not investigated that. But just know that it's possible to get the cassette drive actually working. But the SDIEC, as you can see, works great. One of the issues is... I can't use a fast loader on here. In fact, any game that uses a fast loader, or if I try to use Jiffy DOS, for instance, that just will not work on this. And specifically the reason why is that Jiffy DOS and fast loader routines, they bypass the kernel routines for accessing the uh, floppy drive or you know the, S the IEC port. And what happens is in the kernel, we've remapped those IO ports so that this now works. But if you load Jiffy DOS, if I put a Jiffy DOS kernel in here, it's going to go back to using the wrong I.O. pins. And even if we had a disk drive plugged in and we used a piece of software that had a fast loader, it's also going to go back to using the wrong pins because it will bypass the kernel altogether. It's kind of a bummer. Theoretically, if someone could disassemble the Jiffy DOS fast loader kernel, we could make similar changes to it as were done to the stock kernel so it would work with the 6510. I'm not good enough with 6502 assembly language and disassemblers, so I'm probably not the right person for that. So that's that's the limitation. <laughs> well, there you have it. Uh, there's my fixed C16 using a 6510 processor, homemade adapter, and custom modified NTSC kernel, thanks to Andy for giving me the PAL one. This machine is now operational. I just have to order that extra RAM so I can get this thing to a much more usable amount of RAM because 16K is just too little. But uh, that's it. So I hope you found this interesting. I, I know I covered a lot in these two videos. Feel free to ask me questions. I'm gonna put all the links to the files like the pin mapping, uh, the kernels and stuff in the description so you can download all that stuff if you need to do this modification yourself. Well, so yeah, there we go. So uh, thank you very much. You can subscribe for more videos. I appreciate a thumbs up if you liked this video. Of course, if you didn't, you can put a thumbs down. Put your comments and questions in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.